military drivetrain parts. And not only were they dependable, but they were quiet. And to get a quiet gear drive, you got to have perfect tooth profile. And that's that's what these things did. These were German uh, shapers, they call them. And all it was was a plunger that went up and down and cut them internal teeth in that ring gear. That was the ring gear that was used in the final drags of our of the white tractors. But uh, uh, they, again, uh, Charles City had a lot of traits that uh, industry-wide were known for high quality. Jim Gabbiani is another operator, he, and he, went, he ran uh, external uh, gear hobs. And again, look at the number there. H is for hob, five double ball seven, was the asset number on it, and uh, that would, uh, uh, he, he was cutting teeth on the external part of a shaft, or the external part of the gear. And uh, these were, a lot of the, these gears were a helical gear, where they weren't straight cut, they were on a curve, and then again for quietness and reliability and higher torque ratings. Just an overview of the machine shop, again this is building number three looking west on it but the, the shop office was elevated the, where the timekeepers stayed and the uh, inventory people were and, and of course your department supervisor and it was just kind of keep an eye on the whole plant make their, their, their particular department from the machine shop then then we had to the, the gears had to be hard shafts had to be hard and everything else so we'd machine it to a, a close a reasonably close tolerance but then they'd send them to send them to heat treat to get them hardened and a lot of times it was just a surface hardening or something but this particular furnace this is a view of a it's called it was called nicknamed the Edsel. and the and the reason it was <laughs> called that or part of the reason there was only two of these furnaces made in the United States. One is in Detroit, one was in Charles City, and they're a very high production machine. They, they were continuous flow where parts were moving through it constantly, and, and it would take, I remember we would start that furnace up, say, a, a day or two before production would start on it, say over a Christmas holiday shutdown, we'd have to go in there and get that thing running at least two days before production would start, get it all up to temperatures even, but it, 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 it was a, a very high production machine that was, uh, it was very efficient for parts that you had a lot of numbers on, but uh, next slide. This was the control area on it. Uh, basically, uh, about every 10 minutes, they would load a tray and it would go on this portion, set parts on tray at like 10, 15 gears on tray. It would push it into the furnace and another tray would come out of the furnace and it would go through each one of those blue boxes there is a controller for a separate zone in that furnace. So it was heating them up to a certain temperature and then maintaining a temperature and then maybe going through a quench series. And, and, but it, uh, a very complicated thing and it, it was and once in a while there'd be a part pile up in there and we'd have to shut the whole thing down and wait for a couple of days and crawl in through there and see what the problem was. And was if you ever had claustrophobia you never went in there but it seemed to me so Dave Simon who worked for me said Dave you gotta come in and take a look I think he just thought I, I need to, he just wanted me to get in there see what's going on but we, you know a door would be jammed or something it was always something Again, high production. We had also just what they call batch heat treat furnaces for low production. Say you only had 10 gears you needed a heat treat. Well, these are just, they'd load them into the furnace and, and it'd go through its process of about four or five hours of heating, quenching, and everything else, and that batch would come up. But you, need, you needed a blend of both because you didn't always have a super high run of gears. You might have just a small amount of gears, say repair parts or something like that. So another part of, of heat treat was what they call uh, induction hardening. And this would be a, a setup where 
the, a shaft would be hardened, case hardened on the outside through induction. It was very much like your induction stoves, uh, stove tops that we have today, where it didn't it didn't heat the whole area. It just it just heated the outside skin, and that's what this shaft right here would have been. It was standing that it would get it bright red hot and quench it immediately as it, as it moved down through the shaft. And this was used on PTO shafts and long shafts, transmission shafts, where you wanted a hard surface, but you wanted that shaft to be able to twist and give under torque loads. Otherwise, if they were hard all the way through, they'd just break right away. But, so the, we had a number of those. After heat treat, then because of distortion and everything else and the parts, then they would go to the grinding department where they'd take them to the exact specifications to get them to the exact print. This is his name. This gentleman's name was Norm Jen. We called him Big Jim. And he's running an angle grinder. And you can see the shafts off to his left there that he's he's grinding to get the exact dimensions on him for uh, prior to being cleaned and shipped or sent to the center line. Harley Troutman was the inspector, the final inspection, uh, or Frank Troutman, I'm sorry. And before anything left the machine shop, there would be one final inspection before it was either sent to the assembly line or sent. At this time, when at this time, Trout City was doing a lot of contract machining in the last few years. We had a, a number of customers outside of of Agco that were requiring parts and parts that you're looking at there that he's got these were tie rod ends for mining trucks that we had machined for a, a company and so we just giving them the final go before they're shipped in other words if they, the final go is before they go to the assembly line or they go to the shipping dock another part of the plant and the folks that remember here locally the building that was relatively new is built in the 50s where the water tower was over the top of it was just as you were going down east street to be just to the west of east street on the south side of the plant site that was division eight and basically it was full of presses and brakes and, and welding and, uh, and various fabrication area uh, and this is just kind of a roll with some of the presses and the next shot will show um, this particular press here uh, in the foreground it's it's a 850 ton press that we got from Coldwater Ohio when they when when they moved prior to the move to move the assembly line out of Trout City they, they deemed that Trout City should be the casting, heat treating, machining, fabrication plant for all of Allied products. And so we did receive a number of machine tools, and and this this press was one of them that was uh, they brought in from Coldwater, and, and it was dedicated to making what they called a turtle shell, and it was from disc molars that we made for Bush Hog. And it was a tall piece of metal about that big around. It was like a disc blade that was stamped and formed and blanked. And that's what that machine did all day long a lot of times because we, we built a lot of them. This, this is a close-up view. The, the last backup one went there again. I wanted to show you. In the background, there was a 2,000-ton press. That was a huge press. And that came from the Cleveland plant where they made crawler parts. Uh, we got that in the 50s, 60s. And that uh, press was, it was dismantled and sent to China at the auction. But uh, that was a huge press. And my office was basically all across the aisle from that, probably 50 yards away. And every time that would cycle, it rattled a desk in my office. Because it, it really let out a big bang, but bunking, I didn't go on to the next shot. This is just a close-up view. You can see how huge it was. What that was used for in the later years, a lot of, was the side panels on the white tractors. We had the dies and everything, and it was only pressed big enough to handle that. And the sad part of it is, you know, when they moved tractor production or the assembly line to Coldwater, Ohio, oh, we're going to do all the sheet metal work. 
Well, they didn't have a press big enough to do the work, so we had to do a lot of the work, ship it out to them. And Al Utes was the uh, time study in manufacturing engineering. And the deceiving part on that whole move was 75 to 80% of the man hours that was involved in building the tractor was still done here in Chelsea City. We shipped it in components to cold water. They did a little painting and, and put a motor in a tractor chassis which we had already built, and they were the assembly line. But it is a political thing, you know. I suppose they got a big grant for having a, the assembly line moved to Ohio out of Iowa. This is just kind of a sentimental picture here. Uh, Ronnie Jayden, a cousin of our mine, uh, this is a picture I found of him. and. It's a big hydraulic press where they would be bending uh, metal that was probably, well, it would be the thickness of this podium two before or something, draw bar supports, that type of thing. It was just him running that. That's, that's what that press was used for. We had, also in Division 8, was a, a series of weld booths. There was about, I think, about 20 of them. And each one of these booths obviously had a man in it, and, and this was before robotics and all that, but every, every weld booth, a guy would be in there welding away, and it was a time, you know, he was on an incentive, he'd get paid so much, and, and so all the parts would be gathered to, to make their assemblies, you know, for instance, like a drawbar support or the main hinge on articulated tractors and everything. But uh, they, in the 70s, when, when production was so high, these were running seven days a week, 24 hours a day. That, that was kind of like that. Okay, uh, on the foundry, and my knowledge in the foundry is quite limited, but uh, in 1973, they installed uh, uh, an environmental system on the foundries that included a, like an 800 horse fan that where they grabbed, they, we collected all the smoke from the furnaces, the cupola furnaces. There's two cupolas. Uh, each one is a coke-fired furnace, and and so one would be used one day, the other one would be rebuilt, rebuilt and recharged for the next day. So they flip flop back and forth. But all all the exhaust from them furnaces was run through this environmental system. In the front, you see them two big rectangular boxes. That was what they called the bag houses for for environmental air in the foundry. So, uh, and we had a, a number of them and air cleaning, air quality systems in the foundry. There was like three of them. So what their goal was, is that if the foundry air in the building itself would be totally recycled every 15 minutes. And it was still, and you'll see in the next few pictures, it was not pretty working in there. It was dirty, filthy, but, uh, Guys liked it, I guess. This is just a shot of one of the cupolos dumping molten iron into what they call the four hearts. And, and, and this iron is about 2,850 degrees. And then this, this four heart would then dump into a, a, a movable ladle that was on a crane. So the, the, once that cupola started flowing iron, you couldn't stop it. So you had to be pouring iron and keep it keep that four hearth enough for is that was like your catch tank, your holding tank, you know, and so you had to keep moving iron all the time because there was no stopping that cupola from 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 unless you shut the air off and they didn't want to do that. You know? This was just a, a shot showing the uh, the portable ladles. They were on a, a motorized label but ladle that would pour iron and these 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 are the molds here they call them the flask there's a top and a bottom to it but that that was a constant moving conveyor there that, that had uh, molds all in it where they were pouring iron in them and that ladle was moving with it so the, after the after the flask and cool down in other words the total mold then they would go to a, an area called knockout where they try and bust all the sand out and grind everything and these are transmission housings so you can see all lined up there that have had the sand kind of mostly knocked out of them pounding and they're going into what they call the mill room which was 
use of chipping and grinding and taking any of the flashing off the casting. Hard industrial work. Bob probably knows that. That was just, that was mean work, wasn't it? I mean, I wouldn't want to do that. But any, any, I'll take any input. You know, I'm, like I said, I'm not an expert, but it's just a neat shot. But you can see the environment in the air. Look at the smoke. That's just the, After, after the castings were made, the, basically the west side of East Street was all cast iron machining. The east side was steel machining and, and fabrication, but the west side was where all the castings were, were machined. And this was a, <clears throat> this particular set of drills, it's called D5102, it was called, the, the, they were Cincinnati tape drills. And rather than having a computer system, they had a punch tape that would put the data in for the location of the drill to run and everything. And these machines were run by my neighbor up the road. His name's Eldon Olson, and he ran them for years. It was right behind the personnel offices where he ran them. They were three, a bank of three drills. In, in the early, you know, in 1974, um, White Motor poured a tremendous amount of money into the Chelsea plant. We put in almost $20 million, $17.5 million in the machine tooling. And this was for the new series of tractors, the ones that were the, the, was initially the 2135, 2155. It used the internal, that was a whole new design drivetrain. Uh, and this is some of the multiple drills that they put in for drilling, and you can see that's the, the, the final drive housing is a huge casting, but that was some of their investment. On the, right beside it, in, in what we call building eight, was what they called the, it was a transfer line, and it was, it was nicknamed the Barnes line, and that was because it was all Barnes drills that were used, or Barnes machine tools, but this was a line where they drilled and milled the front frames of all the tractors. And um, it, this is quite an old picture. That, that, that line was in there for quite a number of years. But look up above uh, what I like to point out. That building was built and finished in 1947, I think it was, or something like that. It's all made out of wood. They couldn't get steel to build the building, so they made it out of wood. And, uh, how it didn't burn down is beyond me, but we uh, were able to, maybe it's due to the super uh, maintenance department keeping fire extinguishers on the <laughs> We also had a, a lot of computer, they called CNC uh, machining centers. They were, uh, they were all driven by computers where a product, a rough casting would go on that machine and it would not leave until it was fully machined. Uh, and uh, this is just some of them. The one on the left is an Excello. The white one in the background there, you see the big tool rack. It looks like a crown on the top. It would automatically change tools and everything else. That was a Toshiba. And that was another machine tool that we received from Coldwater. Nice machine. And that run 24 7, seven days. Of course, we had to, after parts were all machined and everything, we had to, do, had to run them through a washer, and uh, that was, it was just like a giant washing machine on a conveyor belt. So. Okay, this is, parts have been all machined, everything's ready, to, now we can start building a tractor, and this is, a, this is basically that same transmission housing uh, the very early stages would be station number one of the transmission assembly line, and you can see parts on both sides. It was it wasn't anything fancy. It was just uh, the transmission housing was set on like a trailer or a wagon, and you, you did your job, and then you pushed it on to the next guy, and and, and and you know everything rolled pretty easy. But this is just station number one. We're at the very bottom. This is further down the line. You can see the axles are put on the housing. Uh, um, this machine here, this would take the whole transmission assembly and tip it upside down and we'd run it. 
and spray oil and solvents up in there to get any rid of any of the manufacturing debris. And just for some of you that remember him, that was Clarence Justice's dream, if you remember that name. He, he come up with that idea and everybody thought he was crazy. He was a little bit crazy. We called, they gave me a crazy coat in the, in the plant there. But, uh, but it did work. It was a, it was a transmission flushing fixture. Okay, after uh, the assembly line was moved from Charles City, uh, this is what we sent to either cold water at first for final assembly uh, to the tractor, which you know was a very heavy component, or later on once Agco bought the white tractor line, went to Independence, Missouri. But you can see in the floor there, right underneath that, that's the main conveyor of the original tractor assembly line. We'll have some pictures of that, but you know, it basically wasn't used after that. Once we got to this point, we were done. We also, in 1972, White Voter decided that uh, it made a lot of unhappy people in Hopkins, Minnesota, and, and Lake Street plant, Minneapolis. They moved the engine production, Minneapolis Moline engine production, to Charles City. And this was just the uh, assembly line. That, and again, we had all these sub-assembly lines feeding into the main assembly line. And then where we made, we put together engines and manufactured engines. It just happened to be a, This is an uh, irrigation engine on test. Every, every engine, once it was assembled, according, went through a series of tests. And uh, we had two test cells that were basically running 24 7. And again, another part of the assembly line was a, a, in the, we called it a clean room. This was where the power shift transmission, what we called the over under, was put together and it was tested before it ever left. And then uh, this was just some of the sub assemblies that went into that. And again, testing more of the hydraulic components, everything was tested before it ever went to the assembly line to make sure it met specifications. Here's the, the back on where the track, the rear transmission case has just left the transmission line. And, and it's the front of the tractor is being married to the rear of the tractor. And you can see that sign up there on the on that post. It says main conveyor west station number one. And what that meant is that's the start of the, of the uh, moving conveyor. It was 550 foot long and had 38 different stations that where the guys would be putting on uh, uh, different things on the track. And, and we, could, we could vary that conveyor to build anywhere from 120 tractors, 120 of the 550s a day, down to about seven a day of the great big tractors. And so if you look at, uh, if you do 120 tractors, the 550s, that was every four minutes the tractors coming off the end of the assembly line. And, and on the standard, like this size frame tractor here, that was uh, is about every 15 minutes. Is what happens. And, this, and this is just prior this conveyor is just prior to it going into the paint booth area where the whole chassis was painted. And, uh, and, and then they had a, a heat, a heating, uh, an oven after that that dried the paint. Of course, later on in production years, the you know, cabs were, went from probably being less than 10% of the tractors being built to 95% of the tractors being built. So we had a, uh, we were buying cabs. They were manufactured in Rochester, Minnesota by Kremlin. But then we went to manufacture our own cabs in the plant. And we had a cab assembly line. And this is where you can see where the cabs on the right are being put together and then transferred over to the main assembly line where they'd be installed on the tractor. And every tractor then, prior to it leaving, after it got off the assembly line, every tractor, and, and this it, this would go on around the clock because they couldn't keep up during the day, would be tested. Went through a series of tests for about 
all 30 minutes at the most, where they check for leaks, check for performance, make sure that it's putting out the horsepower that it's supposed to. This is the end of the assembly line here. This is on the far east end of the plant, where you would just, the tractor would be just coming off the line, but out, off to the right was, was what they called the bullpen. And all this was was a series of, of, of basically mechanic shops where any corrections that had to be done on the tractor, you know, you didn't stop the assembly line if you were short apart or whatever. Uh, you keep that line moving and then they would be going to the correction area to, to be finished. And then if tractors needed something changed prior to shipment, say an order on a tractor didn't have the right size tires on it or something, they bring it back in here, change tires, whatever, or change, you know, some options that maybe weren't on the tractor that the tractor was ordered with, and they do that. And that, that was a, basically, that was a two-shift, at least, if not three-shift operation there. Would be just guys, mechanics, just changing things out. Okay, this was, a, a again, 1974, uh, they, they built, well, this was built about 73. There was a dedicated building for just these articulated tractors. And this is one of the, it was called the White 4150 Articulated. They were a row crop articulated tractor, four-wheel drive. And uh, this was just a shot. I would probably one of the first ones to come off the line. And, and again, we were averaging, the whole plant was averaging 60 tractors a day. The June of... 1974 is 1,256 tractors, so we we're cranking them out. This particular line was a dedicated building, a brand new building off to the south on the east side of East Street. It was, uh, uh, was just to build these tractors, and they would build about anywhere from 10 to 12 a day of those, and then plus 45 to 50 on the main conveyor line. So a lot of iron leaving leaving the plant. Here's a shit here, just an aerial shot of the whole plant uh, taken in the mid to early 70s. Uh, well, you can see it, yeah, it is the late 70s because this, this is that the new building that had the dedicated assembly building for the articulated tractors. <coughs> Down here, a lot of people, the collectors refer to this, the test track, which is still there. Um, you can Google it on Google Earth, and, and you can see that you know it's quite an expanse. You know, twenty-five plus acres of roof, and a little alone is sixty acres of ground. So, from a, a meager start, nineteen one to this was quite a quite a deal. Okay, then came the demise. What happened here? Uh, in November of 1994, the demolition of the plant began, and it was in 1993, on the, like the placard said, in July of 93, that the 400 plus employees that were involved in the plant at that time, I know it was way down from its peak, still a lot of payroll, walked out of the gate the last time. Uh, Craig, I think, was one of them. I was one of them. Uh, and uh, this is... This is kind of the demise of what happened. Uh, just a little history on it, you know. The end of the Chelsea plant probably happened in June of 1991. And Agco had purchased from Allied Products the white tractor line. And, and yet Chelsea supplied all the components, just like we were sending them to Coldwater. We were going, we were sending them to their Independence, Missouri plant. They had an assembly plant down there. And uh, then in 1992, Allied Products announced, well, we got to have a, we got to raise here. They announced a 20% increase in the price of all these components. And Agco said, we can't afford that. So what happened is that they, they looked elsewhere. They went to Coventry, England, had some components made. They also went to Beauvais, uh, France, had more things, had a tractor built there, 
and your Chelsea was left with no customer, and and that basically ended us to us. Allied announced they would close the plant in July of '93. You know, and, and June, November of '92 is when the announcement came that there would be there's not going to be any more business here, or we're, we've lost the business. And I'm sure you guys that were working there at the end remember those days. I mean, we. They said, oh, we got to keep building, we got to keep going because they wanted to build up a big inventory for Agco. But we knew in the end that it was going to be done. So, just more shot, kind of a depressing thing, but it, it's reality. But, you know, uh, I just wanted to bring this up that it's, it's really ironic because the, the salvage company that tore down the White Farm Art Power Oliver plant. The, the, their main customer for hauling all this salvage, and it was truckload after truckload of scrap iron leaving Charles City, was to, to Weissman Steel. Weissman Steel is in Waterloo, and their main customer is the John Deere foundry. So, in every John Deere for quite some time, <laughs> there was the heart and soul of Hart Par. <laughs> I tell you what, those guys that were tearing that factory down, because I, I came up here and I, I was going to grab a couple of bricks from that area, they they did a great job of chasing me off of that property, because I threw the bricks in the back of my grandpa's car and said, get the hell out of here, because <laughs> they, were, they were hell bent for election on not being on that property. Yeah, yeah there's, I, I, I don't want to say it here, but I can talk to about it afterwards, there's quite a story on on why we have a plant whistle here in this museum. And it was not because those guys cooperated with us. <laughs> but, uh, and again, this is taken in December of 1995. And as you drive by, you can see Mother Nature's really amazingly taken over the place. But uh, the 23, this is all that remained after 23, you know, 23 acres of buildings and, and, and and the start of a dream of two young men and uh, almost a hundred years prior to that. This, just a couple shots here. It's just kind of amazing how things evolve. Um, this was prototype number one. It was the conception of, a, of the, what they call the low profile uh, articulated tractor. And this was an Oliver idea, white, uh, white new idea, or white farm Oliver idea. The next shot is is generation two of that prototype, and this was uh, a lot of this was done. The styling on this was done by a good friend of mine, whose dad was named Kenneth Jacobson. He worked in a model shop at Hopkins and in Charles City, and then later to Libertyville. But they came up with this idea. And that was what was going to be the the, 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 the the articulated Oliver or White Farm tractor that was going to go into production. And probably Larry remembers this. I think this was out at our farm one time, plowing. Then this is the third generation. This is what went into production. And and part of this is it's kind of an interesting story because. Uh, uh, Bunky Knudsen, you know, he got fired. He found out from Ford who was boss. He got fired out of there, and White Motor picked him up as the new president of the company. Well, he drug along with him uh, to to White to White Motor a guy named Larry Shinoda, who was the stylist for the Lincoln Continental and the Ford Mustang. And he was involved even with, with Chevrolet for a while in the early, early versions of the Corvette. But he come up with this, uh, this styling, and this is what we went into production. And then they also came up with the field boss name. Well, think about that. When he came from Ford with the Mustang, the Boss 302, all that stuff, it, it, it carried that mindset on. And this was the result of... Bunky Newton and his buddies. This was another conceptual thing that was going to go into production. We made one of them at the plant, but uh, it was again, it was an idea. Basically, it was an Oliver 2255 that was rebadged as a white 
2155, but it, it never came to fruition. Um, it was replaced by the 135. This is a picture of the very last tractor on March 25th of 1988. Um, it was a white 100. Um, they were a beautiful series of tractors. This, this particular tractor is owned by a farmer in western Iowa. It's pestered constantly. You know, it's, a, it's the collector's dream. It's the, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, the uh, holy grail of tractors. I don't know if you're a white guy. But, uh, this was a marketing thing done by, a, uh, his name was Herb Budwick out of White Motor. Um, did we squash deer? No, I think, but we tried. You know, so it's, uh, basically. Here, uh, just any questions you have? Just a couple of pictures of, from the museum at Heritage Exchange last week. The largest four-wheel drive tractor made in Trump City and the smallest white tractor made in Trump City. What can you add about the American series? Because there's always rumors that that American series was going to be more than what it came oh, out to be. Yeah, it was. Because we were, I was involved quite a bit in the development of that, but we are so constricted on cash. And the reason it was called the American Series is because at that time when it came out in 1989, it was the only tractor in the United States under 100 horsepower that was built in the United States. And so that's why they called it the American. But uh, it was, we had to use existing components. We were pretty constrained on, on time plus uh, cash to develop. You know, it wasn't the... And probably the reason it didn't really take off is the imports were much more user friendly. They had a shuttle power shift in them, this didn't, and, and they just had a lot of things. Although the people that use have these, they love them. I mean, they're bulletproof tractors, but I don't know what happens, you know. There's quite a few out there. There's always talk of, you know, like they're, you know, it'd be great if it was. Like you said, shuttle or synchronized and had tilt steering on it, yeah. and all of it. Is, and we had one in the prototype shop where we had the, one of you Oliver guys that had the had the nice platform on it, had the tilt steering and everything. Used the existing view platform that we had, the value engineer platform. Coldwater came and said, "We, you can't afford this. We, this is too much money. We, you got to get the cost cut down on this. So eliminate all that stuff. You know, it's." It's a constant yin and yang between engineering can design the most fanciest thing, but marketing says they can't sell it because it's too expensive. You know? Yeah. How much horsepower does the biggest tractor have? That's well, 325. That's what it was designed. So, with that, uh,